All right, ladies and gentlemen, our last speaker before we break out for a coffee. It is, oh, I need these again, guys. <laughs> Oh, 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 so much better. All right. Case study, responsible implementation of AI in the banking industry, financial crimes, risk management. I would like to welcome Mr. Yaron Hazan, VP of Regulatory Affairs at the TARE. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much. So I'm the only one standing between you and the coffee break, I understand. So I will try to make it short, and I hope uh, as interesting as possible as well. Uh, Tetera is an intuitive AI uh, technology provider that is focused on solving uh, financial crime challenges for financial industry. Tetera was initiated by two math professors that actually wanted to use the ability to detect anomalies in large sets of data to heal cancer. But instead of healing cancer in the human body, what we found ourselves doing eight years, nine years after the company was established is uh, healing cancer in global society, which are the terrorists, the criminals, etc., etc. So, what have I done? Oh. Okay. <clears throat> Myself, Yaron Hazan, the Vice President for Regulatory Affairs, I come from a long background of fighting financial crime, all the way from being responsible on terrorist funding investigations at the Israeli police, through PwC, leading the, the practice at PwC for seven years, head of compliance at HSBC in the crazy times of implementing new standards for anti-money laundering and financial crime compliance, but in the last five years, it's the first time I feel I'm one step ahead of bad guys using Tetere. My, my discussion today, or my presentation, is not about Tetere today. It's about AI. Why to use AI at all? Why do we need AI? It wasn't here 10 years ago, or actually it was here 50 years ago, but it wasn't that applied in business or in banking 10 years ago, and now everybody speaks about it as the future, as the era of uh, the new technologies, etc., etc. So actually, when I studied economics at the Hebrew University 20 years or 25 years in the past, uh, the key thing you, you learn on the first year that any economic growth is is based on two drivers, two key drivers. There are more, but two key drivers. Resources, like natural resources or human resources that uh, a community may have, and then technology. Technology was, was described to us as the ability to jump each time from certain capabilities to breaking the limits to other capabilities and to find additional opportunities and to do things faster and smarter, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we all said that we live in a data era and here, I don't know if he's still here, I want to compliment the CEO of Rackbank that just spoke before me. It was amazing. And the fact that we all become data subjects is really shocking and fascinating at the same time. But it, di it did tons of data, and we need to maximize it. Actually, we have to maximize it, not only need to maximize it, not only to be better or to be, bring more profits, but in our use case or in risk management at any use case, to be able to identify what's going on and to prevent large schemes of crime or uh, terrorism, etc. Digitalization, COVID, of course, speeded it up, but we all work much more on the digital, on digital channels. Uh, my mom is 73 years old, but she uses WhatsApp every day, and uh, I couldn't imagine it five years ago or 10 years ago, but anyway, we are all moving there as data subjects. 
And of course, we search for effectiveness, we want to reduce costs, et cetera, et cetera. So there are pros and cons, opportunities and risks. We want to be faster, we want to be smarter, we want to reduce cost. Uh, we want to maximize resources, of course. Uh, and we want to identify hidden events. What are hidden events? In the business side, like the examples that were given before me, you want to understand the profile of your customer to know what's best for him. On the risk management side, the hidden events are what exactly is being done in my systems to manipulate customers or to fraud the bank or the financial institution or to help terrorists or criminals just move funds. And here, come, here comes the risks of AI and machine learning. When you apply AI and machine learning, you don't want to get to the wrong judgment. We have seen some examples, I will not repeat them. You want to consider ethical issues, and this is another reason why I liked so much the presentation before me. Because I think culture and ethical code can really help you drive the way you want to apply technology in the best way. And it won't come against you from the back door. Black box. Everybody says AI is a black box. I say no. If you build it smartly, it's not a black box. When you want decisions to be taken only by the system, without any professional, moral, and human consideration, yeah, it can become a black box. But there is a way to do it different. Uh, losing the human touch. At the end of the day, we need human touch. We are not only data subjects, we are not machines yet. And we are not subject to machines yet. Uh, if you remember the Terminator film by Arnold Schwarzenegger, that Arnold Schwarzenegger was the key actress over there, this is like a, that, a science fiction future. We are moving there. Slowly, slowly, we are moving there. And we want to still have the human touch and the human control over things that we use our systems for. And of course, we wanted to adjust the right solution and the right product and the right service to the customer. We don't want to be misaligned with their needs. So regulators, yes, they are one leg behind, but they already started publishing many documents and guidance about the use of machine learning and AI. And yes, in my world of financial crime compliance and fighting bad guys, there are also conflicts between data privacy and the usage of data. But in, in our case, from the moral reason, regulators always say that AML or public interest comes first. But again, what do they expect, the regulators from the financial industry when implementing AI and machine learning? So they publish standards around fairness, ethics, accountability, transparency. This is a quote from the MAS, the FIT uh, standards. But explainability becomes very important. That you need to understand what your sophisticated technology is doing. You need to be able, to, first of all, to explain it to yourself, and then to be able to explain it to other people, sometimes from the transparency principle to your customer. Sometimes, from a risk management perspective, to the regulator. Why do you trust the controls? Then comes the implementation. There are standards for implementation. There is a regulatory expectation that when you implement a machine learning or AI solution in your financial institution, you will be able to, to be clear about the use case, to make sure the data is the relevant data, data security, of course, but also that you test it, that you train people, that people understand what they are doing with it. Otherwise, it's even worse than a black box. And the, at the end, there should be the ability to validate the, the, the effectiveness and the appropriateness of the implementation of AI solutions. And this goes all the way from documentation of what you have done after you understood it and defined it well, governance that was mentioned here at least twice. How do you govern these processes and these techniques that you apply? And of course, procedures, controls, etc. So I, my presentation is about 
AI and responsible implementation of AI in general, but I come from the expertise of financial crime compliance and financial crime risk management, so I will take this case study to illustrate how it should be done and to showcase that it can be done. So, first of all, human involvement in the process. Because both on the vendor reliance from the financial institution responsibility perspective, uh, there is a limit to how much you should and allow to rely only on the vendor. So you have to have people involved in the definition and understanding of what is being created. Uh, expectations. Sometimes we have visions, sometimes these are dreams, and sometimes these are disconnected from reality. When we come as vendors to sell you the solution, we will promise you the mountains. In most cases, we can even showcase why we do that. But you need to have realistic expectations because, again, data is the king. If your data is good, you can maximize things. If you apply the right data sources, maximize things. But you need to understand the limitations as well. Skill set. Suddenly you need to have data scientists in your bank. Suddenly you need to have them even in your compliance or risk management or business teams, not only in the IT teams. These are circumstances that can make the difference if the implementations will be successful or not. Uh, IT landscape, infrastructure, hardware, software, all these things that will enable right and good implementation of machine learning and AI. Now, I read an article two years ago, I think two years ago, that said that uh, almost 95% of implementations of machine learning in the banking industry failed. And I look about the, the process that we at Tetere went through, for example, from six, seven years ago to today. Six, seven years ago, the minimum time for a project, not even a production implementation yet, was a year. And it was almost, it almost felt like exhaustive even for us, that we wanted the deal, we wanted to be part of the implementation in that specific bank. But it was so long, and sometimes people at the end forgot what they started at the beginning. Today, we had a project here in Dubai that we completed in two weeks. That makes a difference. That gives the bank and the financial institution very uh, clear, fast uh, possibility to decide how good it is, does it serve the purpose, etc., etc. And again, not relying only on the machine. It be, we, get, we got to this point because we created solution for specific problems with a combination of knowledge and technology. So does it really work? This was my question at the beginning. So you want to have it, it putting on through the tests of efficiency, effect, efficiency, effectiveness, time to value, in our case for alerts, for investigations, you want to, it to work. And the numbers are astonishing. And this was what our customers testify. Reduction of false positive, reduction of number of alerts, accuracy in finding the right cases, 95% Relevant cases for transaction monitoring. Everybody that hears that tells me, Yaron, come on, you're bullshitting me. The industry is around 99% false positive as, as an average. We flip the coin. So all these numbers are resulted in what we say, saving people lives, giving people the, the feeling that they do the right thing in the bank. Imagine an analyst that come to work every day investigating 10 alerts per day that all of them are false positive. He becomes fatigued. He, he, he doesn't even remember why he's doing that. He's just documenting the process. Imagine an analyst that finds things that he knows that help people and save people lives. But again, black box, standards, regulation, how does it fit? We created a full documentation and process around the system that made it fully transparent, fully explainable, with model risk management and model validation framework. Regulators love our system today. Why? Because at the end of the day, we save lives. We found the case of child trafficking 
for one of our customers that the compliance team in the bank told us, and I was in the room and, and I'm excited again now when I speak about it, only for this case alone it was worth running the system for a year. We prevent terrorist financing. We detect illegal wildlife trafficking. We detect uh, drug trafficking, illegal gambling networks, and we save children as well. So at the end of the day, connecting it back to things that were told here before about the balance between morality and the, uh, the smart business usage of AI, in our case, it's very easy because it goes side by side, it goes to the same direction. There is no conflict. You know want to do the right thing, and you know you can. Uh, so thank you very much, and I'm open to questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Hazan. Yes. Right in the back here. Hi, thanks so much. Awesome presentation. My question is a little bit technical, right? So with regards to machine learning, uh, it's trained on a specific data set that comes from, let's say, the last five years, et cetera, some historical period, and it's deployed in a time that is the future, right? It doesn't know, it hasn't been trained on that data set. So how do you account for in-sample training on historical data and deploying it in a world that is adapting every day, Russia, Ukraine, some conflict happens, and macroeconomic fundamentals shift? So how are you tackling with that problem of deploying AI when there's too much uncertainty in the world? Thank you. Very good question. Learning from history, creating profile, puts you in the dilemma that you might fall into traps like this. But consistently, in any analysis run, we analyze one, profile versus history, two, profile versus the population. Why? Not only for these reasons that are strong enough to do it. Imagine a new customer, you don't have a history, and he's immediately on the first or two months start financing terrorism. You want to detect it. So anyway, we always measure normality also against the population. And then huge trends like COVID, like uh, a war, do not impact us as they impact uh, other uh, methods. Mr. Hazan, one question back here. Yeah, so uh, you're on great presentation, great case study. One of the questions I have is uh, sp specifically that you said two weeks fast deployment here, over here. Oh, now I see you, yeah. sorry. Um, uh, a lot of the, the work uh, when you look at uh, large organizations, banks and otherwise, is in the data preparation and what's ready for your model to consume, right? Because I'm sure you perfected your deployment, et cetera. So how much uh, the data quality and readiness of the customers was important for that two weeks to value to actually materialize? And how much did you need to help them in preparation and training, et cetera? Uh, excellent questions as well, because data is always the challenge to begin with. But uh, what I told in several conferences, even here in Dubai, that we cannot, as a banking industry, give ourselves excuses that we don't do things right because the data is not uh, right or not ready or whatever. I will give you the best example. Swift data. It's always structured the same. If you execute the, uh, the, the cross-border payment, you always have it in the same format. We ran it in one week. It will always look the same. We, we automated all the ETL, all the data processing. We identified the, the holes. We identified the empty fields. We don't let that, these empty fields impact the judgment of the algorithms, and you can start. We need more data to maximize it? Of course, but what, what will you do? Wait until all the data will be perfect? You will never end. So we start with what we have. We let the banks maximize what is the most available and most structured and most uh, uh, expected to be at a certain quality data, and we immediately detect crimes. Later, we can, of course, always add more data sources. Hi, uh, here. So I wanted to ask you as the Regulatory Affairs VP, um, do you think that the regulation is, has caught up with AI or FinTech? You know, first you launch a product and that's where later the regulations comes in place because you don't know what regulation has to be put up. So what do you think? Are we there yet or are we far behind uh, from regulatory perspective? I'm particularly asking for FinTech and RegTech, you know? So just wanted to have your opinion on that. Thank you. 
Okay, so what I tell every time to regulators and to banks, that uh, regulators, and it was also said here today, are always one leg behind. They learn from the industry and then they publish the guidance. So I'll give example for the UAE. The UAE cryptocurrencies is one of the opportunities and the areas that UAE as a country look at as something that is very interesting. There are challenges, there are risks, yes. What I recommend is to implement in advance, both to banks and regulators, the highest standards so we will face any future regulation. And like banks are moving forward in many businesses, products and services, even if not all of them are fully defined with the, with the, with the existing regulation, create your own standards. If you apply what the CEO before me said, and it's amazing, ethics and culture, you don't have to be concerned with regulation. Regulator, regulation and rules are designed to make us do good things that will not harm other people. If you look at it in these glasses, you will find the right way to do it, especially if you only improve your risk management and detection of crimes. Uh, I'm here. <laughs> Yaron, you mentioned that you're doing some research uh, for cancer. A question for uh, an experience, for example, you passed through, through the days of COVID. We were trying to get imagery uh, for the thoracic area to detect, probably are aware of that. We all lived through these circumstances. So we've been trying to collect information from France. France has nothing, UK, some open data uh, published, uh, but they are not really that useful. Running through the hospitals of Saudi Arabia here in Dubai collecting information. So the importance of open data in, in different medical research is quite important. And as a regulator, how do you really see the future of enforcing or putting some sort of a vision for open data for the humanity? What's going on? It's not really moving anywhere. It's just promises with nothing. Okay. So first art from the tetra answer from the tetra perspective and then from my view about what you said about what's coming and what I want to, to be or how I want the future to look like in this aspect. From tetra perspective, it's very simple because the bank owns his own data. We always start with that. We never share it with another bank. What the only thing we share are the, 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 the signals the type of features or red flags or risk indicators that were found that in many cases you cannot expect them and predict them like I cannot even with all my 25 years experience of fighting bad guys. So in Tetra it's very simple. We don't go to personal data out there and search for it and complete the picture. And by the way, I don't believe in that as, as a basic step. I believe that it's a completing step to understand the case. Now, where do I think things, things are going and where I think they should go, okay? Uh, so in terms of my PII, my personal information, the GDPR, all these privacy rules that uh, now put very basic principles of if you collect data from someone, he needs to know that he owns it even though you take it and then you can use it only for the purpose that you took it. This is the principle number one of the privacy rules ev everywhere, okay? So if as a culture, as, as ethics, we put this in our mindset as organizations, that's perfect. If not, machines will take over. And at the end of the day, even like the example that we had today, you did not define that you want to prioritize gender or do you want to prioritize things because you have some ethics and principles, but if you uh, give uh, AI and machine learning every data that is possible, even every personal data, and give them the responsibility to do it with it, whatever is possible for certain purpose, you will get results that you never wanted and never expected, and I will never support this. Thank you very much, Mr. Hazan. It was a very insightful presentation. Thank you Thank all. You. Enjoy the break.
Ladies and gentlemen, we are now off to our coffee break of 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Please do not hesitate to speak to um, the exhibitors outside and the, uh, the panelists that were here today if you still have questions. Thank you. <laughs>